Hello everyone. A warm welcome to Ulvili, a series hosted by Weekends. Here, we can share their stories on why and how they became vegan, how it has impacted their lives, relationship, and how it changed the way they see the world. The series is co-hosted by Kerala Vegan Movement and Stala. Stala is passionate about building communities for a social change. It brings like-minded people together and help them share, learn, engage, and grow as a community. So myself, I'm Ria. I'm a vegan since last six years, and I'm working as the content creator in a media agency at Kochi. Uh, so before starting the section, please keep your mic muted. And if you have any questions during the section, you can either use the chat box or unmute and ask directly. Uh, and for handling the chats and questions, we have Amrita, who is a weekend on the autism spectrum. She's a photographer who has worked in animal care, rescue and autism awareness and advocacy. She's a volunteer in the Vegan World 2026 project by Climate Healers and a part of the Ulvili team. Hi, Amrita. And for today's section, we have Anand Shiva, who described himself as an earth-loving maverick. He's a subject matter. Sorry, I got muted. Uh, so he is a subject matter expert on customer engagement and value enhancement with over 30 years of experience in advertising, data led marketing and social and conventional CRM and ORM. He's also a well-known motivational speaker, creating awareness on health and environment through his talks and workshops. He has been an incredibly strong voice for wildlife conservation and sustainable living for more than a decade now. He was the co-opted board member and animal welfare worker at the Animal Welfare Board of India and has been a passionate advocate for wildlife protection and ecological conservation in India. Anand Shiva has been mentoring and inspiring so many of us through his avid research on health and environment, as well as his activism and movements such as the Avni campaign, India Green and Wild and several others. Hi, sir. Hi, everybody. Uh, we are so honored to have you with us. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining us. Your introduction, you, was, your introduction was longer than my session. <laughs> I, do, I don't intend speaking for such a long time. Okay. Are we good to go? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, to, uh, lots of you there, much more than I expected. So I hope I'm able to do justice to the time you're going to spend here. Right. Uh, before I start... I want to put down some very fundamental ground rules. Okay. The first ground rule is that I'm not going to be talking alone. We're going to do some interesting activities. We're going to engage in conversations. I'm going to ask questions. You're going to answer them. And you're going to answer them right, wrong, doesn't matter. Some questions don't even have a right, wrong answer. So I'll trick you into those questions. And you have to ask questions. And I would like to answer those questions. as well. So this is not going to be 45 minutes, one hour of one man giving you a boring lecture. Okay. I don't know to give lectures. I've always walked out of lectures. Okay. The second ground rule is for you to remember that I'm going to talk to you uh, based on a lot of my own life experiences. Okay. I am not a doctor. I am not qualified to make any medical opinion. But I know for sure that I'm very qualified to take on any doctor in a conversation because of my learnings, right? Which sort of brings me to that first question before I start off, right? Please remember, I am not a doctor, so I am not giving you medical advice. So any of you with health issues, with health requirements, any kind of medical support, etc., it's always good to consult your doctor. But end of the session, that's one question I'm going to be asking you. Would you like to consult your doctor? Okay. Uh, the reason I tell you that is I have very, very successfully completed 10 years of not being treated. I've gone to doctors. I'll explain to you why I've gone to doctors, but I'll explain to you that. Okay. So the question, first question that I'd like you all to answer is I see quite a few of you here. Do we have any doctors here? Can we have that, that question on screen? I want to know. 
any doctors here and when you answer this question uh, what i'd like you to remember is if you have anybody close in the family parents siblings sister in law brother in law children anybody in your immediate family if you or your immediate family are on the show let me know if it's an s or no i hope we have some doctors last time last time i did something like this in a kerala event quite a few doctors it turned out to be quite an interesting event okay if that's what, what do we have oh 13% of 50 that's quite a few okay doctors here i come okay thank thank you for that quick all right good so let's let's get started now there's one more question that i need to ask you and that's primarily because all that i will be talking to you right now is based on this very fundamental very simple question how many of you here on this session right now have pets at home when i say at home i mean at home so don't tell me pets in your sister in law's house aunt's house and all of that you have to have pets and doesn't matter which animal it is i'm hoping that there are more non dog pets at home than dogs but dogs cats rabbits guinea pigs birds squirrels last time i asked this question somebody said i have a snake at home okay then it turned out that the person was talking about the snakes running around in the farm all right what do we have how many of you have pets at home that's nice half of you okay good so so i am going to talk to you about learnings that i've got from my animals my pets and from a very very obese giraffe that you have all seen in the invite that came to you right so you can you can give me some answers on the chat how many of you who have watched animal planet national geographic discovery any of those channels have ever seen an obese giraffe say yes just send me a message on chat yes no have you ever really seen an obese giraffe or an obese zebra obese whatever so a hippopotamus and a rhinoceros could be considered big have you ever seen one that looked completely out of shape right interesting so the fact is none of you have seen an obese zebra none of you have seen an obese giraffe what all of you are here because you are intrigued by the fact that there could be an obese zebra or a giraffe right okay so i'm going to go back to about i think 11 years ago 10 yeah 11 years ago uh when we brought a, a cat home okay she was rescued there were people who were abusing her we brought her home and after bringing her home we discovered that she was pregnant right and within a few days of coming into our house she was ready to deliver she suddenly one day got up and she went to the kitchen from the kitchen platform she jumped on to the refrigerator from the refrigerator she went to the loft she inspected and then she certified that that place was good enough for her delivery she came back she was loitering around for a while she had a, a good meal and she went back and to us we didn't hear anything from her we gave her some time and then when i peeped in nice cute three little kittens born there she is just there coolly licking them away beautiful scene so happy they all survived two of them are still with us one got adopted right and then i said so there's something something very fundamentally wrong with us as human beings right can you imagine any of you here can you imagine a human delivery happening like this you go into some place nobody knows what you did you deliver without any help nobody knows what happened and then suddenly you're holding a baby in your hand and so you're not licking the baby but you're at least cuddling the baby you're having fun with the baby you're enjoying that bonding no it doesn't happen that way right what happens first thing is i have to be careful about what i say here because my wife is also attending this the first thing is 
all wives want the husband to drop work at 5 o'clock in the evening come home take her for a walk hold her hands talk to her give her milk with badam you know do all of that and if there is a really really old tradition mother or mother in law at home they want you to add saffron they want you to add all whole lot of stuff so that the child will be born fair now i understand in some parts of up they also have clove because clove makes the child male so i don't understand how a female uh, child can suddenly become male because you gave it a bounce of clove but fact is we need a whole lot of support system so it starts with that walk in the evening right and then you have to go every month there is a report card you have to take your weight you have to look at the baby's weight i was listening to a radio uh, interview two months ago and i believe there's a new branch of science called understanding child diet when it is still in the womb goodness gracious what are you going to give the child a diet plan when the child is still inside right this is like setting up a phone even before it's manufactured right but that's the extent of science right so we go through all of it and then do we do we have children the normal way no we need a doctor we need a gynecologist we need a pediatrician we need an anesthetist in just in case something happens there's a surgeon there's an ot theater there are medicines there are drugs there are napkins a hundred things that we need and then finally when the child comes out they all go to the mother and father and say congratulations they said please go to the hospital and tell them come if they delivered but the fact is human nature is incapable of handling all of this by itself not as nature intended us to but is that truth right uh, those of you here who are mothers how many of you have had a completely normal delivery and how many of you have had a home delivery home delivery not the amazon type how many of you have delivered your child at home right then look at the kind of lives we lead today why that begs the question is why as the most intelligent species as the most advanced in science with technology at our side are we leading a life so very different from anything else no animal needs all of the science then they are not called the most intelligent species we call ourselves the most intelligent species why is that how can we be more intelligent when we depend on 20 things around us to do something as eating a meal we can't do anything without an ecosystem we can't do anything without a large support system we can't do anything without technology we can't do anything without tools it just list just goes on and on and on we can't do without people ourselves right three months for the first month of lockdown people were complaining so we have conditioned ourselves and we have come into a state of being that we are no longer the normal nature intended people that we ought to be okay so why are we like this right now i'm going to ask you a very uh, simple question i'm going to put up a question on the screen right now right i'm going to give you a list of animals right what i want you to do is i want you to go through it and tell me which in your list would be the most carnivorous animal to the least or the most herbivorous animal you need to give me in an order okay are you getting me right i'm going to give you a set of animals set of different animals you need to tell me which is the most carnivorous and in the descending order to end with the one that's the most herbivorous please go through it understand we are all there with a purpose and then give me your answers and uh, raj when the answers come on let them be on screen for a while so we have the boar we have the chimpanzee we have a zebra we have a rhino we have a hyena and we have a crocodile so which would be the most carnivorous it would be the most herbivorous okay we're not going to take too much time to answer this so we're going to move fast because there are a lot of questions that i'm going to ask you all right okay what do the answers look like
Uh, we got 14% of that. We got, we, we actually have somebody who's called rhinoceros the most carnivorous, okay? Even a boar, a crocodile, and okay. Um, 38%. Is there a way I can see who those 38% are? No, I can't. Okay, anonymous. All right. So let's let's keep that on screen for a while. Okay. Those of you who were confused between what is the most carnivorous and what is the most herbivorous, right? First is, let me congratulate the 38% who got the answer right, which is the hyena, the crocodile, the boar, the chimpanzee, the rhinoceros, and zebra. Okay, I'm not going to quickly tell you, uh, for the benefit of the remaining 62%, why that is right. Okay, I'm going to start with the hyena. What is different about the hyena compared to the other animals? It's the fact that the hyena can eat decayed flesh. It can eat a dead animal even three days after it has been killed. The hyena has two important parts in its body, two important things that help. One, it's got very, very powerful jaws that can crunch through those bones, that can rip apart decaying flesh and actually three, eat it like it's a big feast, right? Because that's how the, uh, the animal reacts to decayed flesh. And it's got extremely powerful juices and acids that are able to bring down that food, digest it and give it the nutrients it requires. So this animal is capable of eating such highly decayed, decomposed flesh. Okay. So why is it different from the crocodile? The crocodile will not eat decayed flesh. It needs to make a kill. If you have watched all of those beautiful uh, programs on uh, National Geographic or Animal Planet, right? It has the ability to hunt and it will hunt. Even if there is a dead carcass flowing down the river because crocodiles normally tend to be downstream, they will want to go for a kill because they eat fresh meat. Like, like any of the other carnivorous animals that we know could be the lion, the tiger, the cheetah, the leopard and all of them. Okay. So the hyena eats decayed flesh, old dead animal. The crocodile goes after a very, very different kind of uh, food, which is fresh kill. Now, the boar and the chimpanzee. So in a way, the hyena and the crocodile are extremely, extremely powerful, hardcore uh, meat eaters, right? The boar and the chimpanzee. It's a very minor difference, but you need to remember this difference because that's what's going to make a difference to the way you eat. The boar is a compulsive meat eater, which means he will he, he can eat a lot of other uh, herbivorous stuff. He can eat fruits. He can eat a lot of in fact, pine nuts are supposed to be something that they love. They can eat a lot of that, but they also must eat smaller rodents and insects because that's where they get their protein from. So there is a compelling need for the boar to eat animal material. But the chimpanzee is a very, very interesting character. Though we like to believe that they are like us, now I will tell you why they are so much more better than we are, right? Imagine all of you sitting in the month of April, cutting into a mango and you see a worm. What do you do? You throw that piece away. Some people would cut the other side of the mango and if it's okay, they would eat it. But most people tend to throw away the whole mango and surely not eat the part where the worm was, right? Because instinctively, human behavior is say no to that part of what you see in the fruit. But the chimpanzee is a very, very smart creature. Remember, he is not human. He will actually pick up that worm and first thing he will say is, hey, this looks it delicious. He will not mind chewing on it. So it's, a, it's something that he got free with every mango. Right? Get a mango and a worm free. And the second thing that he says is if the worm has found its way into the fruit, this must be the most delicious fruit. And he enjoys that mango. So he will not mind eating into it, but he will not go in search of that worm. Right? Now that's why the difference between a poor and a chimpanzee. Now, is there a difference between what the rhinoceros eats and the zebra eats? Because the rhinoceros is also a herbivore and the zebra is also a herbivore. So where is the difference? The difference is in the fact 
that the rhinoceros can also survive on dry grass, which is why he is not a migrant animal. He does not have to migrate. He does not cross hundreds of kilometers looking for green grass, whereas a zebra is a compulsive green grass eater. He needs to eat green grass, which is why they move is why they go in search which is why all of those very very interesting uh, uh, what do you call it uh, situations on this planet very interesting phenomena like the savanna crossing happens why because the zebras need to go in search of green grass in search of water they need to be fresh food right so i'm going to just repeat this for your uh, benefit the hyena can eat uh, completely decaying flesh old food the crocodile needs to eat fresh meat the boar needs to eat animal protein, but can also have uh, herbivorous food. The chimpanzee is a selective eater, not in search of that. The rhinoceros yes, is a herbivore, but can survive on dry food. And the zebra needs to have green food, right? Now, why, why do they eat that kind of food? What is stopping that crocodile from eating decayed fish? What is stopping that hyena from jumping onto a pineapple or to a, uh, to a papaya? What is stopping the zebra from chewing on a rabbit? Or what is stopping the rhinoceros, who is also a very good swimmer, from eating fish? They all have access to all of these. These are all foods. They are foods for different animals. They are all there, abundant in nature. Why don't these animals eat that food? Or why don't they even consider that to be food? A very, very, very simple thing, right? Every animal, every animal eats the food that it is supposed to eat. Those of you taking down notes must remember this. Every life form, starting from a worm to a bacteria, all the way to the mightiest of the animals, only eat the food they are supposed to eat. And is the only creature who has bypassed that very fundamental law of nature. We are the only ones, while we consider ourselves extremely intelligent to have done it, we are the only ones who went about transforming food not meant for us. Right? We picked up food which is not meant for us. We transformed it and we eat it and we believe that that's a very smart thing to do. Okay, What we're going to discover over the next few minutes is why it isn't such a smart idea. right? Because remember, if we going out of what nature intended would transform and eat food the way we do, animals would have done it very differently. They would have done it beautifully. I give this simple thumb rule to everybody. If an animal doesn't do it, don't do it. You are absolutely wrong if you're doing something that an animal doesn't. In all aspects, and I can tell you this very confidently, in all aspects, if we do something that animals would never do, we are the ones who are being stupid about it. Right? So they have this ability to stay focused on what they must eat. And that behavior is designed by their body, their system, starting from the saliva, from their, the first part of digestion that happens, all the way down to the last bit of digestion, their body is conditioned for a particular kind of food, the size of their tracts, the kind of glands they have, the kind of digestive processes they have, the kind of time it takes for the food to get digested. Everything is programmed. They do not allow anything to disrupt this program. Give it a thought. They will not, they will not like anything to come and interfere with their body. They will say no. If, I, if a hyena picks up a pineapple, the pie, he knows that this pineapple is going to do something harmful to me. I will not eat it. What do we do if a child says no to a food, even though instinctively the child might say, if I don't want it, the mom will carry it in her hips, go out to the gate, show the kid the moon, show the kid the dog, show the kid the watchman stick, show a hundred distractions and force food into the child even though the child is instinctively saying no to a particular food. And by doing it again and again and again, we've got the child used to that flavor, used to that taste, used to the food. Then the conditioning starts changing it very differently. 
which is why as you get older you notice why do older people change their diet habits because they say my body is no longer able to adjust that conditioning process goes through a change right if you if you start focusing on that if you start understanding how this works you will understand how a lot of other things work okay uh, so you you understood this right how animals uh, sort of respond to this and how we respond to this we transform food right now what is transformation of food anything that is eaten in its not normal form so we either boil it we steam it we peel it we crush it we do a hundred things therefore it's completely out of place to do what we do i'm seeing a lot of questions coming up because this seems to be something let me just go and see uh oh that's just running past ta 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 is it safe to trust a child with nutrition okay there's somebody else who said something similar okay is it it's not safe to okay, how do i close this i close it is it it's not about trusting a child with nutrition it is about trusting your own body understanding your own body about what nutrition is before you are able to tell the child what is good for the child we'll come to that you will know this i have a couple of people here who have actually done this with their children and you will see how it sort of starts changing of course we are not saying trust allow the child to decide but instinctively we are designed this example is the right one if i can see any of you picking up this you know rot rotten mango or a rotten uh, apple which got a worm in it and if you will actually eat that part with or without the worm then you know you're doing something very very different from what your instincts are saying okay so let's just take a short pause here and i want to put up uh, some other question up here okay uh, we 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 keep we keep talking about a lot of stuff right uh, what's here what is in that what is not in this and so on and so forth right most of us don't know what we eat okay uh, i have a question to ask you guys uh, of the 70 odd people on uh, on the show right now how many of you again when i say how many of you including people you live with your parents your siblings your children very very close relatives that you know well suffer from anything like high cholesterol high bp diabetes arthritis osteoporosis any of those big diseases cancer okay yes i've seen a lot of yeses coming up right okay oh 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 so lots of us all right now so before we understand why we get cholesterol why we get blood pressure why we get into all of this chaotic way of living let's understand something let's understand the, about the food we eat okay. i want to set i want to put up the next set of questions that's a simple question actually you will see a very simple thing as nuts that we eat every day okay i want you to pick your answer based on what has the highest cholesterol to what has the lowest cholesterol okay the nut with the highest cholesterol down to the one with the lowest cholesterol which is the nut with the highest cholesterol and down to one that has the lowest cholesterol i would love to see how many of you are answering this without referring to google doesn't matter if you refer to google google might give will give you the right answer and that will also be the way to be sure that i am not talking things that are not in line with what belief is okay highest in cholesterol to the lowest in cholesterol let's see the answers raj can we have the answers please um 41% the usual suspect cashew 36% or 
coconut is the highest i am 100% sure all the 36% the people not in kerala right 8% put walnut on top and 13% have actually put peanut on top um raj is it possible to tell me how many people have actually responded to this while i see it in percentage how many responses do we have okay we have we got 45 people who responded to this okay out of 69 okay and and i'm hoping like uh, what uh, rahul raj has done the rest of you were either unsure or you were very very sure of the answer which is why you didn't respond okay the real answer to the 45 of you and to those of you who were not too sure or who couldn't get across to google fast enough is that none of them have cholesterol none of them have they are all zero cholesterol so what does that mean it actually tells you that cholesterol is not seen in any plant product plants cannot produce cholesterol cholesterol absolutely requires animal protein to fat to get converted to cholesterol needs animal protein which is why plants cannot produce cholesterol they can have fat they do have fat all of those nuts that i put up have fat if i now asked you to ally assign those questions i mean assign that question very differently and say now please tell me highest in fat to lowest in fat we can have a very arguable answer but because there are numeric numbers to put to that but the fact is they are all zero cholesterol had you been in front of me i would have actually played this with a lot of nuts and a lot of cards and you could have punched on those nuts and i would have asked a very very simple question to you is when you don't know the nuts that you consume every day or at least almost every day peanuts we all take it take it very frequently coconut is such a commonly used product if you didn't know whether the coconut had cholesterol or not cholesterol how much do you really know about the food you eat so the question lakshmi was not a prank question alone it was also a revelation you need to realize that we know so less about the food we eat that's very unfair because your body is so dependent on the food you give it your body responds to the food you give it reacts the way you eat it energizes itself or it falls sick all because you either did something out of absolute ignorance or absolute arrogance or with complete knowledge but what you know and how you eat and what you eat decides how your body functions right so the 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 point behind that question to you uh, friends is i want you to please think the the purpose of my lectures wherever i've done it i mostly do it this in corporate circles etc has always been to just stay provocative i want you to go back and think i want you to do your research i want you to read up and i want you to evaluate between the right and the wrong and i'll tell you why there is a lot of wrong information floating around as well uh, especially for those of us either in india or in the united states of america learning things the wrong way with false news is something that has become a habit with us and we've been actually doing this for hundreds of thousands of years okay so cholesterol is completely animal produced now how does it impact the food you eat how does it impact okay it's very simple when you eat a fat ridden diet like you have coconut you have coconut oil you have peanut anything that's got that's high in fat your body by default converts that fat to cholesterol okay i'm not giving you a scientific explanation it's a very very simple one your body converts those fatty acids to cholesterol because cholesterol is adding cholesterol to your body is like charging your mobile phone the only way body can get energy is to take the cholesterol and break it down into acids amino acids into proteins into all that it requires to reenergize itself so energy comes from cholesterol if you don't build up cholesterol in your body you cannot stay alive 
when when they say he died of fatigue he died of starvation it's because the body did not have enough cholesterol to convert into energy so you need the cholesterol which is why nature has designed for you to can eat foods with fats and convert that to cholesterol okay now imagine eating a mutton chicken or a high fat egg right what happens you are already consuming food that has produced cholesterol by another animal right every every animal product is high in cholesterol you will never find a zero cholesterol animal product please remember this whether it's fish it's chicken whatever it is now your body has anyway got used to converting fatty acids to cholesterol and now you're giving it a lot of raw cholesterol the equivalent of charging an already charged mobile if you're lucky and you've invested enough the phone will cut off automatically or some or otherwise it gets overheated you have explosions happening and you also weaken the battery because as it goes by it starts discharging faster so what you need to know is by consuming produce that already has cholesterol you are piling on the cholesterol in your body and that's when your body has to fight very hard now to break down more cholesterol than it can manage and that's when trouble starts and how does trouble start your livers have to work extra powerfully your pancreas have to work extra powerfully your 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 uh, gall bladder has to work extra fast all of them have to work because there is so much more work to do there is so much more work to do that your body starts again conditioning itself very very differently which is why when you have a heavy meal of maybe vada paisam roasted chicken you know scrambled eggs all of that what happens you feel sluggish why do you feel sluggish it is because your body is now working over time your body has to rush all the oxygen that's required to break down that cholesterol your body has to rush the blood there because that's where the oxygen comes from and all that energy is now focusing on the stomach and there is a uh, somebody's got your mic on uh, unmute it's disturbing the flow please if you don't mind so what happens is when there is extra work to be done your body prioritizes supply of blood and oxygen primarily blood because that's a source of oxygen so you will have all of that blood supply focused on your stomach and your intestines that there is a drain of blood and oxygen in your head and you feel sluggish and you talk to people who have given up non veg you people who have given up animal protein the first thing they will tell you the very first thing they will tell you is that i feel lighter i feel more bouncy and people often think that because you're eating lighter food you are likely to feel more sluggish it's completely contrary to that you feel a lot more energetic because your body is now able to focus and distribute oxygen evenly distribute its blood properly to a systematic supply mode and you're able to keep your entire body in perfect functioning space okay uh should i take a pause here any questions that you have if any of you want to uh i don't know if it's safe to say unmute and ask otherwise chat yeah i have a question uh, yes, could you hear yes, me sir. yeah rahul go ahead yeah so i respect uh, you a lot for your vegan activism i've uh, just gone through your page in instagram it's very interesting to see that you do a lot of activism uh, for the animals and things like that and uh, to be clear we lie on this same page uh, when it comes to activism veganism and stuff like that when it comes to animal rights but then uh, i take an issue with you spreading misinformation mm -hmm. especially when it comes to this uh, uh, you just told that having babies mm. you know the uh, process of pregnancy mm -hmm. and things like that mm -hmm. they are in natural you say just a minute just give me a minute a bit of i just freak out i was just a bit furious hearing all that okay so yeah so when you told that uh, you uh, you say that in the nature these uh, babies mm -hmm. they don't uh, kind of uh, uh, you know they're not uh, 
the pregnancy that is not uh, that is happening is always always natural okay so let me just uh, give you some information regarding the mortality rates and that also regarding the uh, life expectancy of people which has improved due to you know advancements in medical sciences and also in uh, medical research if you uh, take a look at rahul the, rahul, uh, rahul just hold on for a second just hold on for a second uh, if there is a doubt please ask now but discussions we will have after the session i completely agree with you on your question i will have that open statement but let's have doubts cleared now and have all those uh, counter arguments and arguments later just to ensure that we don't lose flow and people don't miss out on what's being said right now okay. yeah please note it down let's have a open discussion on that right which is why i said any questions you have let's do that completely open to a counter discussion uh hello uh, i have a question yeah um so you said that animals eat only what they are supposed to eat mm -hmm. um so what humans are supposed to eat like uh, are oh, we supposed yeah. to eat animals or um like are we only supposed to eat plant plant based like plant based diet we are only supposed to have a plant based diet we'll, we will come to that that will be answered in the next few minutes okay okay thank okay. you sir yeah okay Can we move on? Uh, sorry, any questions here? How does the cholesterol intake work out in carnivorous animals? How do they manage? Uh, this is from Sanjita. Okay. Okay. Um, so, Sanjita, and for the rest of your question is, if if consuming an already cholesterol laden product is bad for us, how is it that animals? So Sanjita, it's like this, right? Which is why the first question that I asked you about, uh, you know, uh, sort of lining up the animals from the most carnivorous to the most, of, is that the body acids, everything that needs to break down the food they eat, is built into the system, right? And therefore, they are able to take that food and digest it and get rid of what does not have to be in the system. So the body is conditioned to break down the food they're supposed to eat. so my endocrine glands don't work the same way that they work for an hyena though we are both mammals and we have the same set of organs the acids that i produce are not the same set of acids and not set of they are not the same intensity that a tiger or a crocodile produces so the way nature has structured us is to give us uh, the ability to break down the food that we are supposed to eat i think that's it's as simple as that So that's a very nice question. The very fact that a tiger does not put on weight eating so much of raw meat, as against a man who could put on a lot of weight, and also end up with a lot of issues. And the fact is, he can't eat it raw. The very fact that you can't eat the meat the way you're supposed to eat in the wild is a very classic example of the fact that that food was never meant for you. Okay. Uh, so, so, the, so broadly, right? When you go back and you understand. what is there in the food you eat it's high in cholesterol low in cholesterol no cholesterol etc and then you look at what your body can digest what it can't digest you will actually realize that we are talking of a very very different uh, structure of how we are supposed to be looking at right let me give you a very simple example and i told you right i have learned all of that i have done and i have all that i have learned from the animals i work with right none of the animals in my house and we have had hell of a lot of animals right now we got three dogs and five cats at some point in time we had seven dogs and 15 cats we had rabbits guinea pigs a horse monkey everything that have rescued right none of these animals have ever voluntarily eaten food that was not meant for them i can never ever get my cat my cats to even lick a piece of beetroot they wouldn't even consider it food they treat it the same way that they would treat a piece of paper right the other thing that we do very wrongly is humans are the only species that does not hesitate to drink the milk of another mammal no animal does it no animal goes in search of another mammal's milk you never find a tiger go pull up a lactating deer and bring it alive so that the cub tigers can suckle on the deer's milk how long does it take for a tiger to teach a cub that you don't do it we have conditioned ourselves to go in search of extra food 
in the belief that we need more calcium, in the belief that we need milk all through our lives, which is why we are the only species who drink the milk of another animal. Now, let me tell you something about milk. Because that's a very, very common question, a very common doubt, and probably the biggest uh, danger area right now. Right? The fa very fact, the very fact that by nature, a, a pregnant mom starts lactating, and when I say pregnant mom, I'm talking of all mammals, starts lactating after a certain period of pregnancy and for a certain period after delivery is designed by nature to ensure that the, by the time the child grows up and has lost its ability to digest the milk, the mother starts stops lactating. So it's, it's, there's, a, there's a direct correlation. A mother stays lactating in natural circumstances only as long as a child needs the milk. What did we do? We said the mom feeds for a certain period of months. Right? Again, I'm talking, not talking of working women and all of that. I'm just saying we, we know that the child drinks the mom's milk for a certain months. And then we quickly transition to processed milk. We transition to cow's milk. We transition to whatever we want. Because we believe that milk has to be a permanent part of diet. No animal does it. A chimpanzee, a zebra, a rhinoceros, a lion, an elephant, they all know that the, that the child that now grew up on mom's milk and got all the nutrition that the child needed has now transitioned to a next level of understanding, to a next level of food, and now has to eat very different food because the body is now ready for that kind of food. So the body is transforming. The food has to transform. If the body doesn't transform, then the food doesn't have to transform. The fact that the child is growing automatically means that one part of the stage of one stage of growth is over and now it's going into the second stage and now it needs a completely different set of nutrition to keep that growth trajectory going. We defy it. We break it. Right? And for those of you who came on the chat for the question on arthritis and osteoporosis and whatever, psoriasis, whatever you have, all of that is related to the food you eat. Okay? Uh, we're going to do a few uh, more questions and I'm going to lead you on to this, right? Since we're talking about uh, milk, right? Like you didn't know plants don't have cholesterol or nuts have zero cholesterol. There, is prob there are probably some more myths that you've grown up with and that you sort of uh, settled down on and not questioned it, right? So the question I have for that is this. If I gave you four or five different uh, objects, products, foods, and told you to give it to me in the order of highest in calcium to lowest in calcium, okay? We did highest in cholesterol to lowest in cholesterol, most carnivorous to most herbivorous. Now we're going to do highest in calcium to lowest in calcium. Please tell me which one sits in the order. Okay, we got radish, we got kale, we got milk, of course, sesame seeds, cabbage, spinach. Okay, I haven't confused you too much. I've given you just a few to choose from. I would have taken you for a jolly ride had we been sitting in front of each other and I put out all my postcards and picture cards for you to align. Okay, you just had six to choose from, right? Milk, kale, sesame seeds, radish, cabbage. Whatever. Let's have the answers, please. Please remember this list because there is a second question to the same thing. Bum. Which of these are in reducing order of calcium? Sesame seeds, kale, cabbage, spinach, radish, milk. Milk, sesame seeds, 10%. Kale, 8 Again, uh, Raj, can you tell me how many people have responded of the 68 we have? There's 40. I okay. mean, sir. Thank you. No, oh, sir. Anand. Anand. Yes. Okay. 40. Of which 83 have said. So, ironically, I haven't got the right answer. Right? For some reason, 
I think uh, people just believed that it cannot be milk because you, like uh, Rahul said, did a, did a little bit of homework and I'm vegan and I'm therefore unlikely to put milk on top of the order. I'm probably going to come and tell you milk is zero in calcium or low in calcium. No. So that, uh, can we just have those questions up again, please, Raj? Uh, sorry, who's controlling it? Is it Raj? Is it Rhea? Is it Amrutha? Raj. Yeah, Raj. So let's have that question again and let's hold it because I have a follow-up question to that. Contrary to the answer that I got of the 83%, milk does have the highest calcium. Okay. But we are not going to debate the remaining five because that's what is not the purpose of this question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Raj, can we bring, bring back the same questions again, please? Right. So milk does have the highest calcium, right? And please remember, we are comparing quantities, right? If you take 10 ml of uh, milk, you take 10 ml of uh, equivalent to 10 ml of uh, sesame seeds and so on and so forth, right? Therefore, calcium does have, not this Raj, the calcium question again. If you don't have it, doesn't matter. Please bring on the answer, the poll results. I can use that. Don't bother, don't bother. Yeah, we'll manage with this, okay? You can, you can actually do this on the chat if you don't have the same set of questions coming up again, right? Uh, now, yeah, there it is. Okay, don't now ignore the question there because the same question. But let me ask you this question with a twist. If you had to rearrange the first one, the first one is in a way right, okay? But if you had to rearrange this in the order of your body's ability to absorb the maximum calcium to the least calcium. What is it? Are you getting my point? Right? We discussed the first one. So milk is the highest in calcium. Okay. Now if you had to rearrange this in the order. Okay. Just for your, uh, for me to clarify the third, third suggestion here, the third choice. Milk, sesame seeds, kale, spinach, radish, cabbage is the right answer from the highest in calcium to the lowest in calcium. Okay. Now, on the same file, if you had to choose your body's ability to retain or absorb the highest calcium to the lowest calcium, which one would you vote for? Yeah, let them vote. Not a hard one. There is, uh, so Lakshmi, since you were the one who called out the prank last time, there is no trick question here, but it's it's in a way related to some of the points that I've already made in the last few minutes. Okay, let's go. Uh, Raj, I just realized we are already done 53 minutes, so I want to wrap up in the next. Like I told you, this could go on for three hours for me. So do we want to do a vote to people saying, do they want to wrap this in the next 15 minutes? So they want to take it longer. I don't have a problem if people are not bored and they would like to know more. Okay. We got 30 votes. Can we have the result please? Sesame seeds, kale, cabbage, spinach, radish, milk. Okay. 55% got it right. Now, here is the interesting part. How is this possible? How is this even possible? Right. So if you go back to the first question we discussed, which is the most carnivorous to the least carnivorous or the most herbivorous, that your body is conditioned to break down the food depending on the food you need, the food you eat will get broken down accordingly. So while milk may have high calcium, your body lacks the ability to break it all down. And I'm not saying it cannot get broken down or cannot get absorbed, but it loses its ability to break down all of that calcium 
and convert it into rich calcium okay now let me let me put this down very briefly uh, before while i am doing this raj i seriously would like to ask you this do you want to put up a question to people to vote for which should go for the next if i should extend this by 30 minutes or i should now just fast track and wrap it up yeah see uh, so uh, if everyone could just write on the chat if they'd like to extend it a yes for extending participants okay we are getting mostly yeses all yeses thank you right uh, i'm glad you people are showing interest and i'm glad i'm able to make some sense out of that human body this is a question out of love to put up i can actually put it up now uh, you think the human body is an alkaline body or an acidic body tell me on chat we don't need to put up all of those questions and lose time is the human body alkaline or acidic get some alkaline i think alkaline alkaline acidic okay acidic okay i'm not going to call out right wrong answers i'm not singling out anybody who's saying giving out a wrong answer or whatever but it's nice to know right so i'm just continuing not waiting uh, too much of time right yeah so those of you who said alkaline yes the human body is alkaline we we often think it is acidic because we keep complaining of acidity we say there are acids in our body we think we are acidic the fact is that we are yes we are alkaline right now why is that important first is for those of you who did not know or who thought you were acidic again you better better know much more about your body please right we seem to know so much about everything we seem to know everything about bollywood actors ipl scores statistics but we know so less about our own body it's important for you to rediscover your body your physiological state of being okay your body is alkaline milk is acidic okay any chemistry students here you will know how do you convert an acidic food to neutral or alkaline because if you don't do it your body can't digest that food so your body has to break down acidic food to a state of either a neutral or to an alkaline state only then can your body digest it right and any chemistry student will tell you the best and the only effective way to convert anything that is acidic to neutral is to add calcium that's a very very standard non negotiable undoubted formula if it is acidic add calcium it turns neutral you can turn it alkaline after that so what your body does is when you consume dairy when you consume anything that's acidic your body pulls out calcium from within itself and neutralizes it first now where is the calcium in your body it is sitting in your bones it is sitting in the gap between your bones in your marrow so what your body does is goes and extracts precious beautifully composed and constructed calcium that is supposed to strengthen your bones takes it into the stomach takes it into the blood neutralizes the food that you have dumped in only to digest and bring back calcium so what you are doing is you have a lot of savings in your bank account you want to withdraw all of it right so you take out 5000 rupees you give five of us 1000 rupees each and then you go back and say whatever you have remaining please give it to me each of us will give you 100 rupees you will come back and put 500 rupees in the bank again so every time you lose 5000 rupees you are gaining 500 rupees just imagine that happening to your bones over a period of time as your body is exposed is tortured is starts extracting more and more and more of bones your body's ability to replenish that is slowing down as your aging happens your bones get weaker and we end up with something very beautifully called osteoporosis 
what is osteoporosis is nothing but erosion of the bone calcium now is now here is a something for you for those of you who said yes for those of you who said yes to having a doctor in your family a doctor in your if you have somebody with arthritis in your family osteoporosis in your family if you have taken them to an orthopedic what would have the doctor told you the first thing those doctors would have told you let's assume that it's your mother who had arthritis the first thing the doctor will tell you is have a glass of warm milk every evening have you people heard it right have a glass of warm milk please go back to the same doctor and ask him a question ask her a question for a change saying doctor doctor for all those who had a glass of warm milk for osteoporosis how many of them got cured if that milk is supposed to get rid of the osteoporosis in your body the very simple question is how many of them moved from difficulty in walking to climbing stairs or how many of them actually moved from difficulty in walking to using a walking stick then to a walker then to a stretcher i have not heard of anybody who's had milk has had non calcium supplements and managed to move from a state of osteoporosis or arthritis to a state of marathons why well, that's possible because when you stop eating into your reserves when you eat food that instead of destroying the reserves that your body is building up you actually supplement it you support it you need to go tell your body i will take care of you you take care of me and when you say take care of me allow me to follow my pursuits allow me to do my running allow me to do my cycling allow me to do my work i will do what is right for you but what do we do uh, somebody asked me this question what is the food i'm supposed to eat we eat the wrong food you want to work hard you probably there are people who are doing night shifts will probably finish this and then say i need to now rush because i have the next call and what do you do instead of giving your body the right kind of nutrition to be ready for the next call you shove in something that is unhealthy but one samosa boom you are not giving your body nutrition you are giving it food you won't feel hungry but what's that the purpose is that the purpose of your body your purpose of your body is to give you nutrition and energy right so when you consume food that is not meant for you to go back to our carnivores to go back to our calcium uh, absorption to go back to our nuts and cholesterol when you eat the wrong food the amount of stress you are putting on your body the amount of exertion that happens on all the organs that need to come together you destroy it all which is why we transform food to make it easier to eat without realizing we are killing okay now let me come to some very fundamental facts for you to understand what you should eat and what you should not eat and i'll tell you why modern day animal farming produces eggs chicken mutton beef wherever it's allowed by whatever food you eat are no longer out in the open they are all factory produced through absolutely artificial means they are now called farm animal factories they are not called animal farms right now what happens is those animals whether it's eggs or chicken or goats or cows are all bred in captivity grown in captivity curated in captivity killed in captivity now what it actually means i'm not even coming to the cruelty part of it it actually means that when we consume that we are consuming food that has never been exposed to the sun your sun is the greatest aspect of nutrition for all life forms no animal ever eats food that has not been exposed to the sun which is why even an earthworm that lives under the soil eats food that has been exposed to the sun your first first remember this if your food is not been exposed to sun you are eating non nutritious unhealthy food that's your first fundamental the second when you eat anything that is factory produced anything that comes from a factory you are consuming food that has been artificially fortified artificially created artificially processed to understand why that is important i want to ask you my last question that for the time we have uh, 
we have that question. I don't know if you have it ready with you, Raj, but I want you to know, tell me, if I picked up five grains, right, and I asked you to tell me, which is the largest grown grain in this world? Okay. Rice, wheat, durdal, corn, oats. I know there will be some arguments about is durdal grain. We won't get into that. Trick questions always have trick answers. But of this five, which is the largest grown grain in the world? When you answer that on this poll, also separately on chat, tell me what you think is the second highest grown grain. Okay, can we quickly move to the answer? Okay, we got 40 votes and 40 votes. Rice, 21%, 36%. So between 36 and 21, we got 56. So more than half of you think it is either rice or wheat. 2% of you think it is oats and 36%. Okay, somebody who thinks Turdal also, okay. The meanwhile, what do we have in, okay, very interesting uh, responses coming for the second most grown. I'm going to tell you why this is important, right? This is answered very typically, very, very typically of people who have either come from the south of India or from the north of India. <laughs> Sorry, it is, it is neither your chawal nor is it your atta nor is it your gehu. It's not any of that. The largest grown grain on this planet is corn. The second largest grown grain on this planet is oats. Then comes rice, then comes wheat. Turdal is not a grain. Now, I'm closing this. I'm going to tell you why this is important. Okay, why is this important? Can you imagine? All of us here in this think it could be rice. I mean, most of us think it could be rice or wheat, but it's actually corn. Why is it corn? Because if you are not aware of the numbers, at any point in time on this planet, there are anywhere between 35 billion to 45 billion herbivores, animals in captivity. And they are all fed corn and oats as their primary food. A cow that gives you milk is eating corn as its primary food. And to go back to my first question of which animal eats what kind of food, you are actually giving that animal a wrong food. How on earth can the milk of that animal ever be good for you? How on earth a goat, a cow that is supposed to graze and eat food that has been exposed to the sun, that is supposed to eat fresh green grass, survive on corn and oats, still remain healthy and still give you nutritious milk. So there are two things that go wrong there. Because the, the cow does not get all the nutrition it requires from the food it is given because corn and oats are the cheapest food to produce and the cheapest to give, package and deliver to the cows. They are given supplements in via medicine. So they are given a lot of steroids, they are given a lot of antibiotics, they are given a whole lot of stuff that should never be going into the cow's stomach in the first place. And for those of you who are moms, you will know this, right? Whenever you are given food, if you are, whenever you are, when you are lactating or you have heard of people, when a child falls sick, the first thing they ask is, what did the mother eat? Isn't it? Why? Because what the mother eats has a direct relation to what she lactates. Your body delivers that. It's a direct correlation. What you eat is what your child drinks. 
how many moms would have had the guts to have three pegs of whiskey when they were still lactating they can't because that alcohol gets into the blood stream also gets into the mammary glands which is why mothers are forbidden from drinking when they are feed breastfeeding their children now if that can have a correlation right why is it that this entire process has changed because corn is produced in large numbers given to cows made to eat artificial food not meant for them and because they can't digest they are given a whole lot of medicines all of that goes into you and when you give your children that so the question that i want to go back is your child the best nutritionist your child is not the best nutritionist but your child does not know that the milk it is being forced fed the cheese the paneer the ice cream the butter the pizza that is being given actually comes out of extremely unhealthy food not nutritious food right so you are not only having unhealthy food you are also depleting your calcium reserves you are also adding to your cholesterol and you are doing a whole lot of things so many things that are going wrong how can you ever ever remain un i mean unwell you will always be unwell right i want to show you two quick photographs okay uh, i don't know if you guys are seeing a gallery view can somebody just tell me are you seeing a gallery view of everybody are you seeing a large screen of only me when i speak it's a gallery view okay how do i how do you ensure that people i'm sorry i'm being a little megalomaniac here there it is okay this was me in 2015 and you see my skin out there right i have a whole it's like one world map i have a atlas there right on top is antarctica on my right cheek is there my chin is australia so it's like a sorry what's happening to the screen okay right now that was me in 2015 2016 i had what is called leukoderma or vitiligo okay so in 2016 i went to a doctor and right no more i told you it's not that i have never been to a doctor i went to a doctor and i first question i asked her is please tell me what this is she looked at me she took out some ultraviolet pen and tested me and she said you got vitiligo i said okay then she pulled out a prescription pad and the question i asked her is what is this for she said i'm going to give you an ointment and a tablet and i have had a lot of people with this in my home so i know exactly how this works and the question i asked her is will you treat this will you reverse this for me and you know what she's a doctor i paid her 500 rupees for the damn consultation she pulled out a prescription pad and she said i'm giving you an ointment i can't do anything about it but i have to give you something now if i had not asked her that question i would have come back home thinking that in five you know three months from now i'm going to reverse it or at least nurture that hope of some reversal right now what happened take a look at the next picture can you can you just go to the next picture please no you don't you can't print it now that's me in 2018 please i know that dog is more cute and more pretty there but please focus on me do you see what is there right now that's 2018 you see some spots now i can ask her to take off this and you can now take a look at my face my wife just told me i am supposed to be an active speaker i don't know how i can get more active than i already am but doesn't matter but please take a look at me as much as you can no makeup no blushes no foundation i promise so when i went to a doctor after it started receding i didn't go to the same doctor because i don't think she would have entertained me after the conversation i had with her then right it's a wonder people have never heard of vitiligo being reversed people have never heard of a reversal of this but it happened 2018 i was chasing a dog on a street because i had to catch her for her sterilization my eyes were on the dog i kept running i put my left left foot into a manhole and i went flying and my ankle twisted 45 degrees and i tore three ligaments such dreadful pain that i fainted on the road fortunately i was picked up a neighbor of mine is an orthopedic surgeon i was in his clinic within an hour usual mri and he looked at the skin and they looked at the injury and he said anand you will never walk in your life again without surgery all right 
and he was he was showing me rooms saying this is where i will do the surgery this is where you will be for one week and this is where you will be for the next five days i said nikhil bloody hell that i'm going through surgery put me on a cast and get me out of this place i was out in two hours i was on cast for three months i was in another uh, temporary cast for another two months i had no painkiller i had no medicines i took nothing but good diet and i grew to my cycling i do my walking i do i'm sorry i can't jump on the table and show you that i'm talking the truth but you have to believe me on this i i went through without a painkiller i traveled i went abroad i went all over the only embarrassment that i had was to convince the security it was a genuine cast but i had no problems i went to a doctor but i didn't get treated i came back home i relied on one doctor who i called up and he said anand you don't need medicines he said the pain is dreadful i can give you a painkiller i said if the pain is dreadful i'll tolerate the pain but no medicines so i went through a only high protein high acidic diet so i had a lot of rajma i had a lot of chana i used to eat about 500 600 grams of just half steamed rajma or half steamed chana not even salt and i used to follow it up with a bowl of papaya or pineapple because the acids in these fruits has the ability to break down the protein and give me rich protein and a lot of calcium heavy diet so i had a lot of pudina i had all that you saw sesame seeds i used to sprinkle it on my rajma nothing else no special food no special cost nothing so whatever i would have spent on my surgery whatever i would have spent on extra medicines etc saved and what was the after effect of that that doctor i see him almost once every day not once as even asked me saying anand how did you manage to walk around he probably thinks i went somewhere else for a surgery so to pr- bring you back what is the kind of food you should eat what is the kind of food you should not be eating we are going to be running out of time if i had to get into the whole uh, gamut of explaining a good breakfast meal a good lunch meal a good dinner meal a good snack in between in a good drink to have etc but i'm going to keep it very simple if you people enjoyed this if you learned something from it if stala thinks it is worthy of doing it i am happy to do only a food for a life without medicine session this one was a was an awakening for you but if you think it's important i am happy to do it so i can more tell you this nobody has ever called me to speak has ever called me the second time right that's been how dreadful the experience has been for them but the fact is when you start eat your food next time ask yourself this question is the food that you are eating meant to be yours how much of the food has been transformed how much of this should be changed how much of this can i do without and how much of this is going to translate to literally translate to some kind of illness somewhere what am i doing wrong go look at your refrigerator if you have more processed food more food coming out of supermarkets the less likely that you're eating healthy food your food need not come out of a supermarket now i'll tell you a secret uh, ria was kind enough to give you a really long long uh, introduction and one of the things that she said was that i spent 30 years in advertising so as an ad man let me make you this statement and please remember this never buy a product that is advertised especially if it is food because if it is really good food that you should be eating it will never have to be advertised have you ever seen your local vegetable vendor put up a poster saying fresh plush orange carrots no what do you see instead milk from what what do they use now farm grazed cows free range chicken polished unpolished eggs unpolished eggs goodness gracious are we buying gold if it is being advertised it is food not meant for you nobody needs to advertise just go around pick up food that doesn't need an advertisement pick up a food that doesn't have to be on offer pick up a food food that doesn't have to be in a plastic bottle a glass bottle a jar if it is food that you can pick up in your hand in a brown cover without worrying about spills without worrying about breakage and if you can come home and have it that's the food you need so question to what you should eat and what you should not eat right the best part of living with this kind of food is to go very very heavy on 
whole plant based food which is you don't cook you don't transform you eat the food in its full entirety the next best is to stay plant based have your spinach have your vegetables have your fruits have everything and the promise that i am going to make two two promises i am going to show you a set of photographs and this photograph surprised the hell out of me because it came to me just this morning of a very close friend a family person who had very severe psoriasis can we have that picture please the psoriasis picture and she's been struggling with it she's gone to a doctor she's been given ointments like i was given an ointment right struggled with it had all kinds of treatment and this is this can be extremely extremely embarrassing can be extremely irritating can be extremely burning and uh, itchy right nothing stopped it and what did she do she did something very simple she went off dairy completely off dairy and you know what happened in she was struggling with this for many years two months after she gave up dairy this is what happened no makeup no foundation no blushes no paint and no water shop also you need to believe that your body will respond to good food just as much as it also responds to bad food so if you're buying food that is processed that is transformed if you're eating food not meant for you if you're not eating like the hyena like the crocodile like the chimpanzee like the boar like the rhinoceros like the zebra you are eating wrong food and you will mandatory it's part of the consequences of that you will end up sick you will need medical assistance at some point in time i'm not cursing you i'm only warning you there are people who have gone through without that we can that is a very very interesting book on this that you should read it's called the china study the china study is a very very long research paper it's a book that went about studying the habits of a small village in china where they had a very high longevity of people with absolutely zero instance of lifestyle diseases so no heart patients no diabetes no blood pressure they are all working men so it's not like they were living a stress free life but they were able to manage it in today's circumstances when you're working on stuff like food when you're working on stuff like stress at home covid respiratory issues lockdown mental issues isolation you need food that will give you energy to handle both body and mind make some changes today condition your body to accept what you eat condition your body to refuse some things condition your body to accept the truth some some things are very difficult to get i heard hundreds of people have told me oh i can do all of it i can't give up chai i can do all of that south indians i can give up all of that but thai sadam i need that's because your body is used to the taste and it's not true it is not at all true it has no bearing on age it has no bearing on community it has no bearing on tradition it has no bearing on anything except your desire to live a life without medicines if that's the only desire you have everything is possible and if it's a desire you have you will learn more you will read up more you will understand what is true and false and you can make dramatic changes to the way you can lead a happy healthy life i promise you this i promise you that i have had hundreds of people i worked with i have had people who called me up and said anand i have stopped my insulin shots anand i am not going through my knee replacement surgery anand i am my mother is now climbing the two floors and i have stopped going back to the orthopedic i have had people who have done all of this in fact i make it a point every time i wish i could get them on call and ask them to give you testimonials etc that's the best proof of having changed a lot of these things okay i am wrapping up with this and i'm because i know there would have been a lot of questions that kept my eyes focused on the windows so that i don't get distracted by the questions uh, but if uh, riya raj any of you want to choose and tell me any particular question that you want me to ans- answer i'm happy we to we have amrita um, here to uh, sorry come. handle those questions okay yeah amrita 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 Amrita, you are mute. Amrita, you are muted. 
thank you anand it was a really uh, informative talk and there's the audience they've got so many questions and there's also so many of them asking to do another session so <laughs> i'm happy to do it i always also happy. happy so i'll uh, take up take up some questions yeah uh, amrita just take yeah. up questions that could be uh, beneficial to a large part of the people right we don't want to take up anything that's very individual somebody asking about their health issues etc and before you start off there uh, to those of you who are asking uh, my email id is anandsiva at gmail.com a n a n d s i v a at gmail.com any point in time always happy to help you make the right decisions so any question that goes uns- unanswered today i am happy to give you help hi uh, can i just uh, ask you the question that i left yeah me, rahul. Uh, yeah rahul just wait i let, let I, i remember you i know you are there i want to take the picture let's let amrita finish those questions which are more generic to people and we'll come back to that i promise you okay thank you yeah okay. uh so just a minute yeah okay so uh, there's some questions about uh, when you were talking about uh, the cow uh, mm-hmm. eating uh, corn so there's a question by lakshmi where she's saying that uh, cows are usually known to eat corn in us so is it uh, that bad here as well mm-hmm. or also girish was asking uh, regarding the same uh, if okay. grass fed cows are better okay so i i'm suppo- i am assuming that the the assumption rather is that what cows eat in the us is very different from what cows are fed in india or any other part of the world where there is a high milk production uh, lakshmi and girish that's a misconception right uh, grass fed cows existed or even exist today when people have few cows and they can take them into uh, grazing lands and give them that uh, space and deliver right my my request to those of you who have that doubt is to actually step out and go to a dairy farm okay the cows are kept tied inside a shed they stand in their own urine in their own fecus they are not taken out for a walk milk kitti aarega kya aapko tax income tax ka uh somebody is sorry i'm not a tax consultant yes uh there are there are no factory farms no animal farms that have grass fed cows it's a misnomer well let me also tell you this lakshmi uh, i i don't want to name it right now uh i can tell you even farms that are advertising in india has grass fed are actually feeding grass to the cow okay but that doesn't mean the cows are fed only grass mm-hmm. it is to satisfy that requirement of being organic and being grass fed that they are saying grass fed it's like saying i eat only salads as against i eat salads so i might eat a salad and then follow it up with something that looks like a chana chola but and then have an ice cream and then have tai sadam all of that but the fact is that i ate salad so the cows were fed grass but the grass was not their primary food they cannot run a farm with grass fed cows that's the very very see a cow needs to eat a lot of food hell of a lot of food a regular cow could give you know anywhere between 10 to 14 liters of milk a day lactating cows inside farms give out 24 liters they give double the milk and that doesn't come naturally therefore they have to be given food that increases milk production dramatically and therefore they have to be given food that is not natural right it's a very it's a very fundamental question they cannot be given the amount of grass they need to eat in a day and imagine fresh grass even if you cut the grass and bring it and you have to feed 100 cows can you imagine the amount of grass they must bring in every day because in 3 days the car, the uh, the grass is dried up so it's not grass fed when i can talk it i'm telling you this out of my experience of walking into dairy farms yeah amrita okay thank you uh, there's a question by monisha uh, that uh, ayurveda always talks about uh, taking milk and ghee so what yep. is your thought on it okay so that's a question that has never ever uh, skipped any of our uh, events or any of our lectures etc right at some point in time uh, the belief that uh, milk and ghee as ayurveda ayurveda prescribes is helpful etc 
may have existed and flourished in those times. A lot has changed. The cows don't lactate. They were that they were lactating the way they were during the times that Ayurveda was written, which is many centuries ago. The way things have come down is that we are now living in a world where everything is artificially produced except what grows organically. So almost all of these products have lost their inherent strengths. And unfortunately, they have more toxic content in them than healthy. A good way for you to try this out and prove it to yourself is go to a laboratory, take a glass of milk and have it tested for anything other than calcium and animal fat. You will find a very deadly disease in it called oxytocin. For those of you who have not heard of it, please check it up on Google. Oxy, O-X-Y, Tocin, T-O-C-I-N. It's a very, very deadly drug. It's addictive. It, in, it increases uh, milk production because it actually takes the cow into a state of high. It's actually a banned drug. It also gives the cow very, very severe cramps. And those cramps make us squeeze out more milk. So, you are, so all of that comes into the milk and therefore it comes into your ghee. So that whatever benefits you are purported to have got through Ayurveda is destroyed because that milk and the ghee that you now consume does more harm than the good effects that Ayurveda was designed to give you. Does that answer? I hope it answers your question. But it's a very, very long discussion that we can have on it. Yeah. Yeah, Amit. Thank you, Amit. So uh, there's a question by Nandita. Uh, she's asking, sir, when it comes to being vegan, there's always a counter argument, which I hear from almost everyone, of maintaining the food chain. Mm -hmm. What is your take on the ego system versus the ecosystem argument? Um, Anisha, the, uh, when, you, when you talk of this question, would you just tell me if I'm right in understanding this? Because there is this argument that says if all of us turn vegan, there wouldn't be enough food for all of us. Are you coming from that line? You can actually Nandita? unmute you. Yes, Nandita, sorry. Yes, right? So remember I told you, if the largest grown grain is corn, and that has been eaten by close to 40 billion animals. 40 billion animals. They eat three times more food than all of us. You understand? 40 billion animals consume the food three times more than what we need. So when you take away all of that land that is being used to grow food for these 40 billion animals, you need to grow food for 7 billion animals, which means you only need technically one third of the land. Now remember, you already have enough land, enough grains being produced for human consumption. And if all of those who are eating meat came back to eating only vegetables, fruits, you only need to add 30% more capacity to what we already have. So technically, you need 15% of the land that is today already being used for a whole lot of destructive farming. So you're going to be consuming that much less water, that much less resources, and therefore make available that much more nutritious food, which is why when you go vegan, you're also encouraged to go vegan for the planet, for the environment, because you're going to be bringing down the consumption of water dramatically. 40 billion animals in captivity eating food three times more than 7 billion humans. And so those of you who are still there, I know a lot of you have started logging on. I'm sorry, it's running late. You may want to read up on something called as FCS. I can do that. I can sort of take this up separately. F for fructose, C for corn, S for syrup. Quick one. The corn that we consume is only 3% of all the corn produced on this planet. Sorry, best of it goes to the cattle. And the fructose corn syrup is the single largest toxic material in all processed food. Whether you buy your Pringles chips, you buy your lace chips, you buy your jams, your sauces, it's a killer. It's high sugar. And the reason why processed food destroys your metabolism is because of this one of the ingredients called FCS. 
and the corn that we use for FCS is alone enough for us to grow all the food that we need. So you're not destroying the ecosystem. You're only enriching it many, many times over. Yeah, but sorry, I, I'm hoping uh, Nandita had a question answer. Okay, yeah, so please go on. Um, there's a question. Uh, how do you manage this kind of diet when we travel? Well, never had a problem. I have uh, ever since I switched over to this diet. Uh, in fact, the, the biggest problem that I was told is, oh, you'll have a problem when you go to Dubai and Abu Dhabi, when you go to Bangkok and Thailand. And I've been to both these places many times. And I probably had better food there than I had in New York and London. The, see, can there be a place on this planet where you don't get fresh fruits and fresh vegetables? Is it even possible? Can any meat eater eat food without a plant product? Right? The simple thing he needs is some masala that comes from a plant. He needs a squeeze of lime that comes from a plant. So there is plant growing wherever there is animal food. It's never ever difficult to find the food. I've never struggled. I've never start, struggled even in 20 hour flights. I had absolutely no problem in spite of the fact that twice airlines failed to put up a vegan food for me in spite of a request. I still found food that I could eat without compromising on what I wanted to eat. Never a problem. If there are travelers out here, happy to take you on separately on how you manage food when you travel. Sorry, should we, should we take one more questions? I'm okay. I'm only worried about people who are starving already. And they'll uh, go back and eat unhealthy food. Uh, I think uh, we'll take the last question now. With Rahul or you have another question? Uh, no, we'll have another question. I, I'll uh, give it to Ria. Yes, Ria? Question. Hello? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Ria. Can okay, you? so how do we manage this kind of diet no, when no, we no. travel? Huh? Sorry, asked, Ria. Somebody, so somebody has already asked that question. We are reading from the same chat window. Okay, should we just quickly go to Rahul and address that because he had a very... Uh, I'm not mistaken, a very number loaded question and probably a long question also. Go ahead, Rahul. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So I'll just start reading some statistics. Statistics. Okay. So yeah. this is the life expectancy of mm -hmm. people in the 80s. Yeah. And when you look, take a look at that, we mm -hmm. see that the life expectancy of people in the 80s mm -hmm. were like mm -hmm. all over the world was mm. below 40 years. Yep. Especially when you take the uh, case of India, the mm. average life expectancy was just around 28 years in the 80s. Now, when years. we come to... Yeah, 28 years. In the 1980, in the 80s. Okay? Which, which, which like figure are you reading on, 19, Rahul? 19th Sorry, what is century your average figure. Yeah, I'll uh, share the source with you uh, later on. Yeah, like, I don't know how I can just screen share. Okay. No, and it's just about mm, India. Mm. Yeah. Fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. And in the, yeah, uh, actually the number doesn't matter much. Like, even if you take it to be 40, that let's suppose mm -hmm. it's 40. Like, the thing that I'm mm -hmm. trying to say is, mm -hmm. in the 80s, the average life expectancy used to be like around okay. 40 years old. There was not even a single country where the average life expectancy was like about 45 mm -hmm. or 50. So now in the 1950s, we see that there is progress mm -hmm. in the life expectancy and a lot of people live more than 70 years, like especially Australia, America and Canada. Yeah, there are a few countries like that. And in the okay. 2000, hello? Yeah, I can. Yeah, and, and in uh, 2020, mm -hmm. 2015, mm -hmm. uh, the number of people living about uh, 80 years old, mm -hmm. that is the average life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Uh, has dramatically increased mm -hmm. and if you take a, take a look at the uh, present uh, scenario mm -hmm. like a lot of people live above 80 85 years old mm -hmm. and what do you think is the reason for this according to me mm -hmm. the main reason for this to happen is mm -hmm. the advancements in modern science and mm -hmm. also uh, a lot of research is being done to mm -hmm. ensure that humans are getting all the uh, adequate nutrition and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, though I agree a lot with you on the plant-based diet, diet, which is like uh, very beneficial if you plan it appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on the same page with you there. But then yeah. what I'm saying is 
the average life expectancy of people have increased okay. over the years sure. and this is due to uh, you know advancements in medical research sure. so uh, in this condition in this scenario why do you think it is appropriate hmm. to you know call out the medical prof- professional and also you know how do you word it like uh, mock them or i don't know like i'm not saying you mock them but then you get my point oh, right like abuse, trying to say so that, i abuse them you don't need to be diplomatic about it i abuse them so i don't yeah uh, mock uh, what them. i was going to say it was like so okay, let's be honest about this them, yeah yeah so so rahul let me let me explain something to you okay uh, though i'd like to have a one on one with you because it could be a really long conversation yeah yeah that would be right? great yeah that would so, be great i let, just wanted that to happen but, but me, then uh, let me explain yeah. this to you first thing i think you got the numbers wrong somewhere the average exp- life expectancy especially in india was about 25 26 years in the 1880s not in the 80s i, I heard you say 80s not in yeah, the 1980s generally like uh, it is a general figure 18 Yeah, 18. Yeah, 18, suppose 15. if it is in the 1880s too, when you take an average, I think it'll uh, round about about to some 40 or yeah, something. So, no, so because from the from the 1900 onwards, we had crossed the 40-year mark. So in the 1880s, it was 26, 27 years, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that is what I said. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. So yeah. So let me explain this to you. There is a difference between living and living healthy. All right. The very fact. that as we progressed in science we were able to increase life expectancy is because we were able to get rid of a lot of diseases that were killing us in large numbers there were a lot of lifestyle diseases even at those times there were a lot of genetic diseases that were coming in right for example cholera right cholera is supposed to kill more children than any other disease on this planet right but the fact is as we started improving science and advancement we have not managed to bring down the number of diseases right i will give you one number that you should research on right go figure out in the early 1900s right how many known viruses and how many known illnesses were there for men humans and what is the number today yeah, why think, has there been a let me yeah, finish I let think, me finish okay yeah. let me finish let me finish why has there been a geometric increase in the number of diseases and the number of ways that people die why has yeah. there been an increase in the number of people who are going through a heart surgery why has there been an increase in the number of hospital beds that are required in every state every district every country so why has that come down shouldn't we shouldn't medical advancement mean that we are now given healthier lives that we are actually seeing a drop in the number of medical professionals required as against that it is projected that in india alone by 2050 we will only have half the number of beds and doctors we need in this country so what we have now is not even enough we need double and we need more than that because 2050 we will not even have half the number of hospital beds and doctors required which means our life healthy life quotient is going down it's not going up and that is the point that i want people to focus on it doesn't matter if life expectancy is going up but is your quality of life going up are you living a life without depending on medicines are you living a living a life without the pain and discomfort of a sickness if you are in any way incapacitated because of your body then quality of life has taken a hit yeah i don't that think that's the case yeah so we consider that like uh, in the uh, olden ages people used to have less comfortable lives they uh, they had to suffer more due to various different diseases yep. and at the present moment it is not because there are no more patients or something like that like i don't know how to put it we'll discuss this i'm getting close to you i'm getting some chat messages saying can we please have a generic discussion here so i let's have a discussion on this i am happy to take Later this forward on. with you yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah can i just complete my point yep yeah oh uh, yeah so i, I was trying to stay with yeah those yeah yeah okay uh sorry you've gone on mute rahul you've gone on mute rahul somebody just muted me i didn't do anything okay, yeah so what is some any of my i guess uh, what is <laughs> going to say was that like life quality has kind of improved over the years i would say 
like uh, when you take the uh, take a look at how people are treated and how you know like generally how uh, uh people are more comfortable with their lives i think the overall uh, medical uh, due to me- no, i heard you i think, I think you're making the same point like you you're making the same point again we i hear you uh, there is there is yeah. something that we need to discover and understand what you mean by quality of life i have a very, very different view on this okay, okay fine and and it's good to have a different opinion i don't think i need you to agree with me or you me to agree with you let's have that understanding but the fact that quality of life means different things to different people is also important right okay fine yeah yeah so uh, yeah. just uh, i'll dm uh, you something like that uh, some other time yeah can you please yeah, are... tell me excuse me we are running out of time yes i can't think of finding up so uh, if you have any ma- more questions you can uh, whatsapp yeah. uh, those who haven't registered yet please leave your whatsapp number or email id on the chat box so that we can connect with you uh, so that we have come to the end of yet another episode of fully uh, i hope this section was very informative and useful to each one of us and anand shiva thank you so much for joining with us hope you had a good time with us I don't know. I was and I was blissfully chatting away. You should ask the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone were asking for part two, so that means everyone loved your section. Okay, I just have a question for you. Uh, will the chat messages be available with you for me to look at and can respond to any questions that can happen later? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. So, yeah, guys, we are winding up. So next week. that is on the 31st of october we have a uh, kids talking on veganism and hope to see you all on the next episode of full willy thank you uh, thank you all for joining uh, good night bye hello bye everybody good night thank you stella for doing this willy